if you've not here before, I know you all probably have been here on these before, but we always start off with a little bit of a recognition of, you know, aperitivo is happy hour, really. It's afternoon cocktail kind of thing. And um, Darren, did you tell Laura and, and uh, Bernardo to have a drink if they wanted them, just to make sure? Of course. Give them a, oh, perfect. Oh, well, water. Okay, good, good, Bernardo. Uh, <laughs> Laura's a mom, so she's drinking water. Um, so, you know, it's a chance to have a drink and listen and talk and get to know some artists better. That's what the whole point of this is. Um, but Darren, who's sort of, it was his idea for this whole series, uh, thought about it as also an opportunity for us to make sure we're spreading the word that an, another industry that's really struggling, as we all know, are restaurants. So to get some word out to places that we can still patronize and help them out and help San Diego stay strong. And Darren's done a great job of doing that through this series, but I think we have a review this year. Is that right, Darren? So I'm gonna turn it over to you and uh, have it do your thing. Right, well, thank you. Uh, yeah, we um, have done this all year with, uh, you know, every other week doing a different restaurant and all of those restaurants are still open, yay. Um, of course, they are not open for in-person in dining right now, but they are all currently doing uh, carry-out service. Uh, uh, Rusticacina, if you remember that restaurant, uh, that Italian restaurant, um, that one is actually also doing um, some gifts, some gift basket ideas. Um, and many of them are doing um, special dinners, prefix menus for the, for the holidays, which is really nice. Um, and I will have all that information available to you um, at the beginning of this recording um, with all of the different uh, restaurants that we've had through the season that I'm really proud to, to say that we support it. Um, and you know, this, this is recorded um, and then it goes out to uh, YouTube our YouTube channel and we get a lot of hits on the YouTube channel. So I'm really excited to help support the restaurants um, that need our support right now. And what happened was I, you know, I was going back through the list and I happened to reach out to Sophia who's on the call right now. Um, and Sophia is director of operations, is that correct? Yeah, for Trust Restaurant Group. The Trust Restaurant Group. So Trust Restaurant Group, and I'll, I'll let her tell you um, all about Trust Restaurant Group but, um, and who they are. They have about six different restaurants and I know a few of them. Um, and we have had a few of their different restaurants on um, in the year. But one of the things, one of the reasons I have her on today is one, to do a salute to all of the restaurants that we had through the years, through the year. Um, it seems like years, uh, but through the year. Uh, but what's exciting is that, uh, that uh, Trust Restaurant Group is doing a wonderful initiative, a wonderful program to help people that are out of work in the hospitality industry. Now that's hospitality. That means restaurants and, and hotels. So it's a bigger, bigger umbrella, very generous of them to do that. So Sophia, would you tell us about that program and, and who Trust is, Trust Restaurant Group? Yeah, so Trust uh, Trust Restaurant Group entails the first flagship restaurant of Trust being on Park Boulevard and Robinson in Hillcrest. Uh, we launched another property called Fort Oak in Mission Hills about two years after that, um, as well as another property in Mission Hills called Cardellino, which was an all-day eatery bakery with an addition of Mr. Trusty Creamery and Ice Cream Window Shop. Um, after that, we also launched a steakhouse called Rare Society, which is where we're doing this industry incentive, which is where I'm actually located today. And then plus a butcher shop that we opened on El Cajon Boulevard called The Wise Ox. Uh, that's open seven days a week, so you can purchase proteins and wine as well as takeout options, plus some hot dinner meals and sandwiches from that location. We just opened in April here, so during amongst the the crazy of this all. Um, but right now we are focused on finding a way to give back. Um, our biggest challenge, I should say, is the fact that we've had to lay off majority of our family three times this year. And having to swallow that was bigger than having to open and close our doors. Having to say goodbye to our family members that we've put so much in to invest in to help grow our team and not being able to know when we give them another paycheck was something that we just couldn't swallow accordingly and had to figure out how we could try to help. Since we can't give them money, actually, um, we decided that we would go down the route of a hot, savory meal 
our wine director, Ben Zuba, came up with a fantastic idea to incorporate a hot steak dinner three course meal that not only our industry and our vendors, but also our regulars and our continuous supporters are able to help us support our team, but also the industry itself. So it's not just for our trust restaurant group family that we're trying to do this incentive for, it's people with other restaurant groups, other hotels, anyone that literally does not have a job and is laid off that just really could use a hot warm meal that's seasoned and cooked and ready to enjoy and just a little light at the end of the tunnel was the goal. So we've already been able to get a good amount donated. We were able to provide 220 meals last night. That was just one of those feelings that you don't get too often when you just give someone a meal and you know they're able to take that home to their family and enjoy something hot and ready. Um, and we're able to do another 300 next week. That is what we already have in the bank, shall we say, ready to go. So now we're just looking to spread the word and hopefully take care of the people that normally service you that we're able to now service them for once is really what we're shooting for. This is absolutely wonderful. You know, this is the silver lining to all of these things that we're going through. Yeah. And I think, you know, as an organization, as an arts organization, obviously, you know, we, we want we want people to support us, but sure. there's no reason we can't help support other people too. And I think that's one of the wonderful things that's happened um, in this you know, terrible climate is coming out in support of each other. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm just, I'm thrilled that, uh, you know, especially these restaurants, like Trust, you know, they're, they're really nice restaurants. You know, they are really, really nice restaurants. Um, and I, I was saying earlier, uh, before everybody came on, Rare Society uh, <clears throat> has a, a cloth napkin with a buttonhole in it that you put for men. And I just, I was <laughs> crazy. I was like, oh my God, I'm in love with this place. I'm home, I'm home. But yeah. you know, they're, they're really very nice restaurants and to have them do something like this is just, I think it's absolutely beautiful. I really do. You know, we're blessed to have a chef that knows how to cook. We're very, very blessed for that. But we've always said, you know, good food with good service is really what takes it a little further. We have to get them hand in hand and we can't really do good service without good food, yeah. but we also can't do good service without our family. And to do good service right now, takeout is available. We are doing takeout from Fort Oak which we're doing a, a mixture of flavors from our trust menu, as well as our Fort Oak menu. And that's open seven days a week right now for takeout, but we're also doing a mixture of our Cardellino and Rare Society menu five days of the week. And yes, that's available, but you know that, that does help us, of course, having some kind of support and having that flow through. But this time around on the pandemic and the full shutdown, it's not the same. It doesn't feel the same. Nobody really feels the same about it. it it's got a different sound and a different feeling behind it all. And I think we can all agree it's, we knew this was coming somewhere in the winter. We just didn't know how bad or how big. And this time around, you know, all we can really try to do is keep our heads above water and stay safe and be safe with our family and our loved ones and push that our family, our staff stays safe as well. And I don't want to put them at risk by asking them to come back in and and do it all over again, unless we know it's the right reason, you know, and the right, right purpose behind it. Right, yeah, this is a very tricky time for, for San Diego restaurants because now there's confusion about yeah. whether they can open or not um, and just came down today. Uh, mm -hmm. Probably it'll be repealed, who knows? Right. But, you know, to put yourself in the shoes of a restaurant owner and say, I'm gonna keep opening and closing and buying product and hiring staff and then close again, it mm -hmm. isn't logical. So, yeah. um, you know, they're getting jerked around just as much as anyone else in this in this uh, situation. So please go and support them when you can. Over tip when you can. Um, really important. You all know. support is also go direct to them. Don't use those other services. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. They take such a big cut. Uh, go to them directly. So Sophia, thank you so much for taking the time. I'm really busy. Of course. Thank you so much, and I, I wish you all the best and stay safe and be well. Thank you. And David, you are muted. Thank you, Sophia. Yeah, I have my voice back. Thank you. So Darren, you wanted to celebrate with some champagne. So. I so yes, so we went and got um, little splits, which oh, is that yeah. adorable or what? Yeah. So I'm having the same, um, just a little champagne. So if you have a drink, champagne or what else you have, um, Feel free to raise your glass and say, cheers, everyone. Happy 
last aperitivo of 2020. So Sophia, thank you so much for being a part of this. We appreciate it very much. All right, so um, I think you guys know, so the way I try to put this together is thinking about people that have been with us and sometimes they are superstars and sometimes they are our staff and, but it's people that you've, you've known before and I want you to get a chance to get to know them better, right? So what's next for us? Anybody wanna raise their hand and tell us what is next up for us because we're about to do it? All is calm, you guys know it, right? So, oh, someone typed in the chat. Uh, that's not champagne, Prosecco. Sorry, Bill, you're right. Um, uh, anyway, uh, All is calm is next Monday. It is less than a week away. <clears throat> so, we talked to Alan, our last aperitivo who directed it. So we get a sense of that. But I thought, you know, like who, who are the people involved in it? Who are the artistic personnel? We would normally call a principal singer. So we have two people joining us today. We have Laura Bueno. Laura, say hello, wave. And we also have Bernardo Bermudez. And you probably know both of them in some capacity, but I thought it would be great to talk with both of them because they are both singers who you will see in the, what are we calling it now? We're calling it something 30, chorus 30 or, you know. Anyway, it's 30 minutes of music ahead of time. Bernardo or Laura, do you know what we're sort of like affectionately calling it? It's the holiday 30. Holiday 30, thank you. I knew that <laughs> I was missing a word. So the holiday 30 is the 30 minutes of music that's happening of holiday favorites live with members of our chorus, which Laura and Bernardo are both participating in. But Bernardo is also going to be seen on screen speaking in a lot of different dialects because Bernardo was uh, involved um, in the original production that we did two years ago, 2018. So welcome both of you, Laura and Bernardo. It's great Thank to you have you with us. Thanks for having us. So I think if people know Bernardo a little better than they know Laura, so I want to start off talking to Laura because I want people to know you a little bit better. So tell us about where you're from and how like music and dance for you because you also are a dancer and I'll tell people where they can remember seeing you dancing so beautifully. <laughs> but tell us about your background, where you came from, all of that. Great. So I was originally born in California and then moved to Missouri and I was there for high school and college, graduated from the University of Missouri with a um, Bachelor of Science in Music Education. And then I moved out here after I had auditioned. This was in 2003. I auditioned for the San Diego Opera Chorus and uh, for Turandot in 2003. And that's that was my first production. So that was 17 years ago. Wow. <laughs> so I've been with the company since then, <laughs> ever since. And um, I've been a member of the core chorus for several years now. But um, but yeah, that, that's kind of how I got started. I also run three different businesses, two of which are not happening right now. I teach ballroom dance in schools, um, which obviously we can't touch. So that's, you know, moot. <laughs> um, but it's Edu Dance Classrooms in Motion. And we've been all over the county for 17 years. And then uh, I, I owned that company for the past two. It was turned over to me after I had been an instructor with them since its inception. My cousin started it. And then I started, excuse me, Playground Players Productions, which is musical theater for children, which is also not happening right now. <laughs> um, I do after school productions and in school productions. And I teach uh, choir music and stuff as a, on a contract basis with uh, my kids' school and which is not happening this year. So my third business, the one that has just taken off this year is Lollipop's Bake Shop. And I, I've always loved to bake and decorate cookies and cakes and all that kind of stuff. So that is what I have been a busy bee doing this entire pandemic. And I've created a nice little following of customers and I've gotten lots and lots of uh, sales and clients and stuff. So that's kind of what I've been doing in addition to teaching voice um, and beginner piano on Zoom <laughs> for some students. So, 
Oh, you're Yummy. so amazing to hear, um, you know, like how your creativity is like kind of finding its own path in other ways. I know that we were able to enjoy, you bake some cookies for us, a decorated for, for, for Aida that were the most gorgeous cookies. Oh, so, thank you. yeah. So, you know, if you want to, I hope we see you at some point on the Food Network is all I'm going to say. So uh, that would be really cool. <laughs> yeah, so you should be on one of those, um, you know, cookie wars kind of things. Right. <laughs> I have a, I have a couple friends that I've that I know I've performed with at San Diego Musical Theater. Um, she was a judge on um, Cookie Wars. Amazing. Yes. Yeah. So, so those of you uh, that saw, you might raise your hand, wave, whatever. Maria de Buenos Aires. So. Bernardo and Laura were both in Maria de Buenos Aires, but Laura was really, I'm just going to say it, was the beat <laughs> dancer. I mean, um, with, our, the twins. with the twins. Yeah, <laughs> but you were, I mean, yes, of course. But you were also, I mean, you're a chorus member. And remember in that Maria de Buenos Aires, the chorus doesn't really sing, they speak. So, you know, you can get an actor to do that. But we used our chorus members to do that. And you also did such beautiful dancing. So tell us about your background as a dancer. When did that start? And So before I really started singing, I always loved dancing. Um, when I was about seven, six or seven, I just fell in love with this little tutu that we that I found in, the, in a shop and, and my parents wouldn't buy it for me, but they went back and bought it and gave it to me as a birthday present. And um, and so I got that little white tutu and they signed me up for classes and then the rest is history. I am um, ballet, tap, jazz, um, musical theater. Uh, really tap is one of my favorites. And then the ballroom dancing, of course, is when I, after I moved out here from Missouri and I got involved teaching ballroom dance, which definitely helped with the tango <laughs> in the yeah, Maria yeah. de Buenos Aires. So yeah. that was really fun, but um, my, I, I still teach sometimes as a substitute at my kids' dance studio. And um, my, my oldest daughter, Marley, who's been in the chorus um, for Carmen and for uh, Chorondok, she's done that twice. Um, she also is a dancer, acrobatic. She does acro and everything. And then my little, my other daughter loves to do ballet as well. So um, love to dance, great exercise. <laughs> and you've been in shows with other companies here in San Diego, clearly, yes. right? Yes, so who, San Diego who, Musical Theater. Yeah. I've, and then uh, Lyric Opera San Diego, when they were still around, okay. I did several uh, productions, Gilbert and Sullivan um, and uh, Gigi. I was Gigi for them and uh, Iolanthi. Yeah. They said th they said they needed a mezzo who looks like she's 17, so. There you are. That's you. <laughs> it worked. It worked. Still, like still. So, so yeah, you can pull it up. Yeah. <laughs> that was a while ago. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so that's Laura. So you guys, you might remember in Maria de Buenos Aires, there was a very beautiful dance moment where you were tangoing with really both of them that was really seductive, but also very beautiful. And you, you're such a beautiful dancer. And, you know, a lot of times we think of, um, many of you know that I worked in New York, with in a dance company as well. So oftentimes in opera, we think of people that are opera singers that move, which is kind of a, yeah, they can move, but you're like a real dancer. Like you're a real singer <laughs> and you're a real dancer. So uh, yeah, it was such a great surprising asset because I didn't know that until I saw you doing <laughs> what, and, and, and those of you that saw Maria de Buenos Aires, uh, John de los Santos who directed it, had a career as a dancer and a choreographer. So, I mean, he knows how to use the yeah, movement great. potential of everybody on stage, right? And he he knew how to make everybody, yeah, like you say, whatever your strengths are, yeah, he'll, he'll choreograph it to accentuate that. And it, it was great. It was really great working with him. Yeah. Um, I, just, I remember so moments where I was saying, I just can't take my eyes off of you because you're so <laughs> beautiful when you're on stage, so. Um, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so it's great to have you back. More in operas world. with dancing. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm all for it. So, okay, so that's Laura. And you guys probably know Bernardo, I'm sure, because Bernardo's done a ton of things. But let's, Bernardo, introduce yourself. Tell us about where you're from and your path towards where you are now. 
Well, hello, everybody. It's always a pleasure to see you all. My name is Bernardo Bermudez, if you don't know me, and I am now a tenor. <laughs> I used to be a former baritone. Um, you're, you're actually a tenor before pretending to be a baritone. Yes, baritone, exactly. So, right, right. As, what do they call it? They, they call us lazy, lazy tenors, right? Exactly. Uh, baritones right. were lazy tenors. Right. Um, no, but I, uh, um, I had the, um, um, I was born in, in the East Coast, and I, um, but I lived in Venezuela for many, many years. My father was from Venezuela. My mother is from Mexico. So I lived in Latin America for many years. And then we actually settled here in San Diego, where I been technically all of my uh, high school years and, and middle school and high school years. And then, uh, and I can say that I'm a San Diegan. So um, I guess my path is, is very um, mixed. I, I started my career not as a singer per se. I was actually in the uh, mental, mental health field. So I'm a, a psychology degree and that's what I did for many years. I, I worked for foster youth, uh, foster family agency here in San Diego after college and then um, and then finally actually I met a, an operatic tenor here in San Diego his name is Daniel Hendrick I don't know if, David if you ever had the, the pleasure of hearing him sing but um, he's the one that kind of said you know what you should you should try out for San Diego Opera and you know and actually I was also friends with Victoria Robertson who you know who is my business partner and um, and colleague. And um, she's the one, you know, they, they both encouraged me to, to try out. And that was back in 2007, I want to say that's my 2008 and that. And so I tried out for the chorus and it was one of those years that, you know, they wanted every single person under the sun on stage, you know, uh, every male singer that they could get because they were doing Tan Heuser, um, Aida, and um, Pearl Fishers, and what was the last one? Cap Pag. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so they needed like every single person in San Diego to sing, and and so I was one of the fortunate ones that I got my start. And the first moment I I stepped on on stage and listened to the symphony play with you know with all those amazing singers and the lights and everything in the civic theater I said I got to switch careers and start singing so um you know so I've been very very fortunate that you know I I had very good teachers and very good mentors and and a lot of support and you know I just decided to invest everything I had to this career and so far, it's it's been very rewarding. So I, I mean, I can't thank San Diego Opera enough because they're. I mean, this is my home. You know, this is my the place where I started. You know, the 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 company that gave me my first opportunity, and you know, uh, I I mean, I don't know if everybody knows that about about what I about me, but you know, I, I really value this company, and I really really truly love being part of it and and being in any aspect, shape or form. So thank you, David, and thank you to the staff for and, and all the patrons, of course, because without you and your support, we couldn't do it, so. See, that's why Bernardo is so good because he's like, um, you know, he's as if he's a member of our staff saying that, very good. Uh, so Bernardo, you just talked about you and, and uh, Victoria and your, your company, tell us about that. So Opera for Kids is uh, our nonprofit that we started actually about a year and a half ago. So we're still on the, on the development stage. And we were, um, so the backstory behind it is that, you know, Victoria and I have been working together for years and years and years doing concerts, uh, a concert series that we call Duetto. And we would we performed all over the West Coast and Arizona and the Pacific Northwest and you name it, and it's that you know we 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 would go to you know performing arts centers and 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 do our our show, and one 
occasion, one of the one of the performing arts centers said, "Do you do anything for kids?" And we were like, "Well, you know, we do master classes and all that." Stuff. And they were like, "No, we have a, a group of kids that have never seen classical music or opera or you know heard great voices, and we want to give them something different. Can you do like something? Can you do a show for kids?" And we said, "You know what? We'll write something, and we'll present it." And so, you know. I've been extremely lucky that I have a genius for a business partner, Victoria, and you know the, in the sense of like she's an incredible lyricist. She can write, uh, you know, she's very clever with writing, and and so we, we technically did a pastiche opera. So we took songs from all over the repertoire, and we literally put new words and and lyrics to it, and that was the beginning of it, the Enchanted Tale. And it was a huge success, so much that we actually got a, received a grant from Music Academy of the West, which I was a, an alumni from. And that's what started us and, and kind of got us the, the seed money to start the nonprofit. So what we do is actually pre, pre-pandemic, we were performing for kids all over uh, San Diego County and also in LA County. So. Uh, so we have this amazing show called The Enchanted Tale. And, and what we do is we try to bring opera and, you know, and, um, and highly, you know, trained voices and, and classical music to children and, and, and pretty much do it in a, in, a, in a way that is easy for them to relate to and entertaining. So, I mean, because, you know, sometimes I feel that, you know, children, they want to hear that, that amazing music, but sometimes it's, it's presented to them in a way that they're, it's a little bit abstract for them to understand. Mm-hmm. So what we wanted to do was really bri- bridge the gap, and that's what we've been able to do. Well, this has been a company that's existed for a while now, and you have a big following. I know that yeah, <clears throat> Victoria, who I know very well, Victoria sang in our course for a long time. Victoria also, like what's one of the interesting things here is how the people we're talking to today as singers have to create their own paths, right? To mm-hmm. Because no one really makes enough of a living off of just doing that thing. So one of the things that Victoria did, very successful singer, same business as Bernardo, but also became involved in the travel industry, developing virtual reality things that you can use on a computer so you can experience hotel rooms through virtual reality. So somehow she became an expert in that, right? Who knows how that happened. And so when we did our opera hack, which many of you heard about, which was this hackathon we did, um, which combined technology and opera thinkers, Victoria was on our advisory committee because she knows about virtual reality. So it's just so interesting how everybody has their own path of trying to find the ways to make it work. But I know that we tried to make a partnership happen between the opera and your your company, and it hasn't happened yet, but I think it right. will happen where we're able to really invest in each other and use you to help us do cool. some of the things that we want to do anyway in schools, right? Exactly. We're, I mean, we and we're delighted, you know, and, and we did get to do, remember, we did a performance of the Enchanted Tale at the at the Greek theater a couple yeah. years ago. Yeah. And, but, you know, we were, remember, we were talking about doing it this year in 2021 as yeah. well. And, yeah. it just, you know, obviously the, the situation that occurred, occurred. So now we are in a, you know, but I feel that, I, I mean, I'm always, I'm always interested in, in, you know, in talking to you and, and the rest of the board and everybody to see how we can we can join forces and, and really bring uh, and maybe even add a little bit of dance, you know, Laura. And, um, right. you know, <laughs> we I feel like, you know, we have so many amazing artists and 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 organizations here in San Diego that we can, you know, we can encompass some amazing projects and and I feel we can we don't have to necessarily um, shop outside the city we have some I mean there's you know uh, you know and we can integrate kids and you know and kids education and music and the symphony and I don't know I mean I feel like this 
the sky is the limit when it comes to, you know, um, bringing art, like high quality art to children everywhere and making mm -hmm. it accessible. So it's and, one of the things that I think everyone knows I've been passionate about is, is taking advantage of the talent we have here. So not always looking outside and to try to give roles, not just course work, but roles to local artists. And part of the reason why I developed the secondary series of Detour was to do that, was to give more opportunities that are not just little tiny, small compromario roles, but bigger roles. And we'll see more and more of that, I think, happening in the future. So um, a very good point, yeah. Um, and I, I think everyone knows that one of my objectives in Boheme was not just to meet the needs of our audience for an experience and a communal experience, but also to provide employment. Because just like we talked about at the beginning with the restaurants, there are so many of people that had not worked since March and were dependent upon unemployment and that was wavering. So all of these are things that are very important to me. So having both of you on this program is, is super important. So let's talk a little bit about what we have ahead of us. So we have both of you on the call. Let's start off talking a little bit about the holiday 30. I just made a, didn't say that right, did I? But anyway. No, that's right. Okay, I got it right. That's so, holiday 30. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, Laura, uh, so, so I just want to tell everybody that, you know, it's, um, you know, it's eight singers. It's holiday music that we will recognize. We're going to encourage people to sing along, but also mm -hmm. feature them. However, as everyone knows, the virus is more severe in our community now than it was when we did La Boheme. So we're trying to be very careful about what we ask of the participants. So it's, it's not a lot that we're asking of you. We're trying to make it as minimal as possible. Mm -hmm. So have either of you or both of you had a rehearsal yet? Yes. Okay, good. I, had, good. One yes I had one yesterday yeah, with my fellow with my fellow alto, Sarah Nicole Reddy. Yeah. <laughs> and we were 15 feet apart in Bruce's backyard. Yeah. And, and, and masked. And masked. And yeah. he was, we were in like a triangle. So Bruce was like way over by his house and Sarah was over here and I was way over here. I could barely hear her. I'm sure she couldn't hear me. Of course. That, you know, just the two of us singing the same part. Yeah. Um, we went through the songs that we have had <laughs> and um yeah i think it's gonna it's gonna be great so you've done that one what we call a sectional and a sectional yes. means if you've sung in a chorus it means it's the alto section the alto section consists of <laughs> two people so we had two singers and we had bruce and bruce has been gracious enough to give us his yard because <laughs> we need to have rehearsals outdoors we need to have the singers 15 feet apart the addition that we have now, if you didn't see it in La Boheme, because it virus was different then, is we need to have everyone masked. So the singers are going to be masked mm -hmm. in the performance. So we'll see how that all shakes out. But so you've had your one sectional. Bernardo, have you had one as well? Yeah, I actually had mine this morning. Okay. <coughs> you, both, you both have been introduced to the music. So I just yes. want, to, I want to make sure everybody understands Most of it. The, yeah, yeah, what we're what we're doing. And so there's a read through sectional. And what's the next thing that will happen for both of you? Um, well, tomorrow I think I'm singing, we're adding sopranos. So it's gonna yeah. be the women. So it'll be four of us in Bruce's backyard. And then after that, we can't add anybody else because his yard isn't big enough. <laughs> To have, even though it's a very nice sized yard and a good yard <laughs> but it's not big very, enough. Yeah. very nice <laughs> um but it can't accommodate more than that at the social distance level so uh i think uh yeah from 11 to 1 tomorrow i'm gonna be with the sopranos and my fellow alto and we're gonna run through the stuff and i think bernardo do yeah, you have another one tomorrow too yeah we have one at 1 30 tomorrow okay so, so right we'll after be, us. the man is tomorrow afternoon so and then saturday the we all get together right yes i okay. unfortunately can't be there on saturday though um yeah. i actually have my one and only caroling gig <laughs> <laughs> I, I usually christmas carol during the season and that's a really good source of income yeah. and i haven't had any we haven't had any gigs um but we have a virtual gig so oh wait i lied i have two gigs i have one tomorrow morning at 6 45 a.m 
Wow. So yeah. yes, I need what? to go to bed early tonight. <laughs> um, it's for a virtual gig and we're gonna be masked with my other three uh, singers. And I think it's for an East Coast uh, business um, event, like a business party. And oh. so it's uh, it's via Zoom and we're gonna be, they're gonna come to us and so it's, but it's really early. Yeah. And then I have the rehearsal at 11 to one. And then Saturday I have a, like a drive-through Christmas gig outdoors oh, in the afternoon, yeah. so. Well, good for you. Good for you. That's fun. And Bernardo, you'll be there on Saturday, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll be there every day. So we are um, having those at a church, I think, just so everybody understands, like we, the ex sort of extent that we have to go through to make sure everybody's safe. This 15 feet, there's 15 feet between everybody at every moment. There's not a moment where they're near, more near each other than 15 feet. They're masked the entire time. We'll see how that actually winds up working. But again, one of the things that I tried to talk with Bruce and all of our staff about was we want to do the best that we can do within the circumstances. So if we have to have singers masked for health, that's what we're going to do mm -hmm. as opposed to doing nothing. And it's going to wind up being the best that it can be within those circumstances, because it's important that we give you work masked as opposed to saying, wow, we really don't want to listen to singers masks. So let's just not do it. Right. So we're going to figure it out. You guys are going to hear some great holiday music. Who wants to chime in on what 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 you're going to hear? Well, oh well, you're gonna you're gonna hear everything from, you know, the Christmas song to "We Wish You a Merry Christmas" and "Carol of the Bells." Good. And maybe Lots a of little a little, a little Spanish flair going on there too. You know. Oh, good. So, yeah. So we have a very, a very, it's, I must say, it's pretty challenging music. I mean, I don't know how you're through it, Laura, but the, yesterday, but I was like, some of the, some of it was pretty, you know, is really beautiful. It's really, really, truly so um, challenging as far as uh, rhythmically and, you know, it has a, it's definitely not just the, the, the classic carols, but good. it's very, yeah. And, and, and how much of it is going to be you <clears throat> singing as an ensemble versus asking all of us in our cars to, I mean, if you're in your car and the windows are rolled up, everybody can sing along anyway, but there are certain numbers that we're asking people to sing as a sing along and other ones we want them to listen to you, hopefully. What are the, how much of it is Laura, yeah. You're muted. Yeah. I well, there, we, there we go. There we go. Um, I'm not sure um, if I don't know if Bruce mentioned to you, Bernardo, but um, he hasn't mentioned which songs will be just us and which will be right. um, oh. sing along. But I, I, I think there, the ones that are more of a tricky arrangement will not be this. Will not be sing-alongs. Will not be sing-alongs. A, a <laughs> but pretty much all of them like follow the same standard, you know, melodic. It's just that it's just that inner the inner weaving of the songs are really they're really beautiful. I mean, yeah. they're really mm -hmm. really really, co really cool versions of the songs. So well, so yeah. for our audience, that's actually a very interesting. So if Bruce did that, that is a strategy, I imagine because Bruce wants you to all have all of them prepared in a way that you might think that it's just the eight of you singing as opposed to the audience joining you. So you need to be peerless and like impeccable in your singing on those, right? So super smart for Bruce to be doing that. And, and we'll all have microphones. Yeah. So, yeah. and then we said that there was gonna be a little heater next to us. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Uh, keep us nice and warm <laughs> and it might be a little little chilly so yep. for so uh those that are listening raise your hand if i see you on screen if you're coming on Monday night. oh my gosh i see lots of hands up that's great oh yay yay so this is not sarah just came back i don't see your antlers anymore sarah um so it's not the same venue as you guys know that oh there they are good well done um, it's not the same venue that we had for La Boheme. This is a venue that exists. So we are just taking it for one night. So we're not having to go to the 
expense and also energy of creating a new theater for this one event. So it's a company called Concerts in Cars that I think there are three venues in California and maybe one in somewhere else. Jeannie, I see you going for your mute button. Do you know? Jeannie, our CFO and COO, knows all these details much better than me, but because um, she's been negotiating the contract. But do you know that, Jeannie? I'm sorry, David, what was the question? Because I was responding to the chat um, oh, okay. dialogue oh, in terms oh, of staying in your car. So, oh, okay. So do we know how many other venues Concerts in Cars has? I know there's the one that's in Santa Barbara or somewhere, I'm not sure. But anyway, do we know that? I, I believe they have three different locations. Yeah. So, so this is a, thank you. And it's a, it's a different, very different kind of uh, layout, which I kind of, I'm excited about. So it's a stage that's really kind of in the round. I don't know if it's a round or a square, but we're gonna have singers facing outward on four different sides of the stage. Mm. And maintaining that 15 feet uh, space is sort of a perimeter and Bruce in the center leading everybody. So that'll be kind of fun to figure out how that happens. But on top of the four sides, very high up, are very large LED screens like what we used in Lavo M, but actually look bigger. But the good thing about this is that cars will be parked on four sides. So the capacity maximum is 600 and something. So on each side, you'll not be more than a couple of hundred cars at the very back from the front of the stage. So it's kind of an interesting opportunity. It wouldn't have really worked for us for Lavo M but it's there, it's a company that does their own screenings of videos, of movies. Elf is being run you know, this week, but they also do <laughs> performances. And there are two performances by California Ballet of the Nutcracker happening out there right before ours. So you know, it, it's an interesting, useful venue that we're going to try and who knows if it'll exist again beyond this. We're certainly going to be doing some more drive-in things um, after this year closes because that's the world we're going to live in. But I think it's an interesting opportunity for us to experience and experiment um, a little bit in this space. So we have a few minutes left. I want to look at questions. Uh, there were, uh, are you allowed to have chairs outside of your cars? I don't think so because you know, we're some of those um, rules around safety. When we're building our own facility and we're selling tickets on our own, we control all of that. We had to sell tickets in this venue through Eventbrite, which you guys know if you've done that. Um, so I'm not quite sure that they've sent that information out. We do not want people to leave your cars because we really want to make sure this is a safe experience for everybody and we want to maintain safety. We had a big success in terms of safety with Lava M. Over 300 people employed, over between three and 4,000 people attending and zero COVID. That's the same story we want with this is we want to have to show again that we can have safety and live performance occur side by side with good planning. So if you're coming, stay inside your car. It's the, and you also, you'll have the better audio experience inside of your car. So, so there's that. Uh, how, oh, Bill, what's it like to sing while masked? Both of you, you might want to respond. Tell us about what you think about well, it. Well, um, depends on what kind of mask you have, I guess. If you have a mask that, it's like, I like to chew gum a lot so to keep, you know, to keep uh, my my vocal folds moist and you know just to so that it, I don't get all dried out. But um, when I'm chewing gum in my mask, I mask can tend to like come come off or come down and stuff. Um, singing, um, it actually wasn't too bad on yesterday when I was singing um, over at Bruce's. But there are some special singers masks that make you look like a duck. I think. Um, <laughs> but, um, 
I don't have one of those. I actually just um, had a few masks made, a couple masks made that have um, music notes on them. So I, and I just got them today, got them okay. back today. So I have them for the performance. <laughs> Yay. But, oh, nice. Yeah. 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 Thought I'd be, you know. Bernardo, what, what's your <laughs> Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I, I didn't feel like it made much of a difference. I mean, I, uh, I mean, other than obviously there's, it doesn't feel like you have as easy way to breathe, but you know, I, I, as long as we're safe, I, I, I'm willing to do whatever. <laughs> so we, and one, one and, thing that I told Bruce when he first called me is he said, are you willing to come and be part of this um, with the health risks and things like that? And I said, you know what? Most singers I know are fairly germophobic to begin yeah, with. Right. So I am willing to be around the people that I know have been taking this seriously mm -hmm. and have been taking all the precautions. Yeah. Right. So I told him that he was like, exactly. And I said, and I know San Diego Opera, you guys do everything so by the book that I feel super safe and I feel very protected and um, I'm willing to do what it takes to, to be able to share music, you know? That's awesome. So I, I want to make sure that everyone understands that what we did with this was given the current circumstances and the change in the virus in our community, we went back to AGMA, which is the union that represents the singers and had a conversation with them about what kind of additional safety protocols we need to put in place, not for our benefit, but for the benefit of the singers to so make sure that we're really going to walk out of this with a big success. And then even after we had the union say, okay, we're good with this. Then we went back to all of the singers who said they were available and had Bruce just ask them one-on-one, -on -one, I just want to make sure that you're feeling comfortable with this and that you don't feel like we're applying undue pressure on you. Like if you say no, that we're going to take away your place with the chorus, because these are all members of what we call our core chorus, which is the tenured group that stay inside of our chorus. And I wanted to make sure that that was the we're, you don't have to do this if you're worried, but we're going to take every measure we can to try to make this safe for everybody. So thank you for saying that, Laura. Yeah. And also, thank you for talking about the singer's masks, which we actually bought for everyone in Bohem because we thought that might be something they would want. And it actually is like a big duck <laughs> that goes out. And what it's meant to do is give you more flexibility with the mask staying on when you go from E to ah, if you can think about the jaw positions that, that singers have to go in for different vowels, it stays in place better, but it muffles the sound big time. So okay. when we bought them for Bohem, everybody was like, forget it. It just, you know, it, it's more trouble than it's worth. So we have some singers in masks, but, uh, and you do look like a duck when you wear them. So that's <laughs> not so cool. Um, all right, so we have a little bit of time left and I wanna make sure we have time for questions, but Bernardo, Mm -hmm. You also are in the film, so I, I am, have I you am. have you seen the video? Yeah, I mean, I saw it on on PBS. Yeah, a, a number. I, what was it last year that yeah. they showed yeah. it, or the year before? Well, the they showed it twice. They showed yeah. it once both years, right? Yeah. So it was live when we did it in 2018. Mm -hmm. 2019, they showed it again. I think on Christmas Eve. Right. Um, it's a pretty remarkable video right yeah it's it's a great it's a, i think it it really uh you know uh really cap was well captured and it really captured everything about the show yeah. so i i thought it was it's a great it, it's an incredible opportunity to be able to bring this great work back to san diego so we um you know we were lucky enough to have kpbs bring in four cameras, I think. And if you remember and you saw there was a big boom camera that kind of hung over and went up and down. And so, so the production video has a lot of close-ups of singers. It's not quite like what we do with Bohem, but it's similar in a way that you have an experience that's wide angle. You have a lot of tight close-up moments of singing. And all of that was done live, which was kind of remarkable. If they know how to do that. They just knew how to capture the moment that was the right moment to move in and move back out. Um, and we've also spent some money over the past week to remaster the audio digitally, which oh, was great. 
Yeah, yeah. So when we did it originally, because we didn't know that this, we were going to need it for this use a couple years later, we did not have mics on all of the singers. We had mics in the air and we had mics on the ground. And if you just listen to it on its own, there's a lot of sound of footsteps and things. So Ross, who was the sound designer for Bohem, who did such a great job, we gave him the audio file. He's redesigned it. So it's going to be really tight, um, really, really tight. And I will say that in our last aperitivo, I shared with this audience um, the moment from that video of Silent Night, which I think is the most beautiful moment of it musically. And it, it's just really great. And after I shared it here, I have to say, I cut it and I shared it with some of my friends that aren't, don't live in San Diego. And it was like, you know, nice Christmas greeting. It's so beautiful. So, so when you come to this audience members, donors, you're going to see the great live experience that you're going to have with our chorus members. And then you're going to see this incredible capture of one of the most moving experiences I've had in San Diego. Um, what was it like for you as a singer to be involved in that cast, Bernardo, and that process, the whole production? Well, to be honest, I, I'm honestly, I mean, I feel like the show is one of the most amazing shows that I've ever been a part of, um, you know, because, you know, there's nothing like one of my favorite groups of all times, like, you know, growing up when I was a, when I was a teenager and being in choruses, you know, was actually like Chanticleer, listening to Chanticleer, which is one of, you know, one of the best male, there's something about the male voice together. I mean, not, no offense to Laura, I love singing with my female, you know, colleagues. It's just, I don't know something about, but something about like an all male uh, acapella uh, singing that it's, it really is, uh, I don't know, it's, it has like just a, a different um, type of, of um, I don't know how to, how to describe it. It's just, it's just like a, a, a different texture to the sound that, that is produced. And, and to be honest, I mean, I was, we were so blessed to be able to work with all these members from, you know, of San Diego Opera choristers that, you know, everybody, we've known each other for so many years. And this piece is just so moving and the, and the letters and everything about it. And, and I think uh, it was the, the partnership between, you know, uh, San Diego Opera and Sacra Profana and also with Bodhi Tree. I mean, everything together, you know, it was really amazing. And, and, I, and I thank you again for, you know, because I remember we brought this to you a number of years ago and you came to our first read through of the, of the, I mean, we wanted to bring the show to San Diego period. And, and I remember, you know, getting Chad and Chris and everybody and getting you involved, wanting to get you involved because we wanted you to hear it and say and give us the green light that this was something that we could do here in San Diego, uh, whether it was a partnership or somehow bring it to the audience in San Diego. And we are, we, I feel that, I still feel that we were, everybody that's involved, was involved in the project from day one feels, has this, um, you know, true feeling that, that this was an amazing collaboration to bring everybody together and, 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 and just create such a magical moment, such a magical uh, performance. So, uh, so yeah, I'm like Bernardo. I, you know, you guys know I was a singer. Choral music was a huge part of my past. And so the choral texture of this, I find incredibly moving. It is ac actually, I, I marketed it as a choral opera, even though that's not what the, creators meant for it to be. It was meant as a theater show, right? It was meant to imitate a radio drama. That was what the original intent was, which, you know, happened in that time. Um, but the idea that the choral music gesture was the strength of unity of choral sound was the most important thing. And that tight uh, emotional context that you have with all the male voices together, telling the story of soldiers. You know, if it wasn't a story just about soldiers, of course, women would make more sense at that point. But telling that story and 
What I find remarkable about it, I was writing my letter for the program recently, and really what happened that night was that the lowest ranking people made the decision to have peace happen because the commanders didn't want the truce to happen. It was the soldiers on their own who hurt each other across no man's land and said, we're gonna find a way for peace to exist just for this moment. And then the, the tragedy, but also the very moving thing about the peace is that they go back to war and you know so many more people die. So it's that moment of peace that existed somehow in the middle of all of this and using music as the metaphor that drove everybody together. And it's music that we all know. I actually think that's what's great about it is that's music that we know. Mm -hmm. There was a question here about, um, are there plans in the future for the orchestra to play in this? Mm -hmm. Not in this because the intention of this piece is that it's acapella. I mean, that's what the creators wanted. They just wanted the human voice to express this story. However, there's a phenomenal opera that won a Pulitzer Prize called Silent Night which is the exact same story by a very important American composer named Kevin Putz. And I would love to bring that here sometime. It does not have Silent Night and Otanenbaum and all of the things that you, know, you have in this show. It doesn't have the real Christmas songs that we all know in it. This does, and this has military songs. So I thought this was a good way for us to start that conversation, but we will probably bring be bringing Silent Night, which is a big opera, uh, to San Diego at some point. But this is what it is. This exists in its own framework of just voices to tell this story that's very potent. So uh, we're about out of time. I love that this is so easy with you guys because we get, it's just like having a conversation and it just happens. Um, are there other questions we wanna ask? Does anybody wanna wave their hand and say, we have a question that you haven't gotten to yet. Um, if you haven't bought a ticket and you're worried, I understand and we're not gonna try to twist arms, but if you haven't bought a ticket and you're thinking about it, remember you'll stay inside of your car just by yourself. You'll have uh, FM radio, good audio happening on that. You'll have a screen above you. And what we're all striving for and craving, I think is the idea is the experience to be together somehow. That's what we're doing right now. We're together, but we're together in our own homes. And when you're actually sitting five feet away in another car to someone else, it also has a really important, um, it's cathartic in a way to us in what we need in the world right now. So if encourage your friends to come, we still have plenty of tickets to sell. We're selling well, we're selling very well. It's one night, remember, it's just next Monday. It's also, early, so you'll be done by 8.30. And if you have friends that have children, it's not long. So encourage them to bring their children because next, one of the reasons we're doing it next Monday is that classes end this week. So some parents might be a little crazy and be going, what do I do with my kids starting next week? So there's an opportunity for you to have your kids safely out of your house and enjoying something holiday related. It is 5.30, we are done. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Bernardo and Laura for joining us. And I hope you enjoy getting to know them a little bit better. And please come to All Is Calm if you can. And we look forward to seeing you then. Bye.